Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Lisette Meza. I'm the current chapter president of our ASID UCLA Extension chapter. And we have the amazing Ron Woodson here with us today. Um, Ron is, um, he, he has a few hats that he wears. Um, he's an interior designer at Woodson and Rummerfield's House of Design that he co-founded with Jamie Rummerfield. And then also an alumni of UCLA's uh, Extension Architecture and Interior Design Program, which we are so proud of. And uh, also founder of Save Iconic Architecture um, on a mission to stop all of these beautiful um, buildings from being demolished here in LA. And then lastly, author of High Style, which I have here. If you guys don't have it, you should get on it. It's not in print, so it's hard to get, but it's such a beautiful book. Uh, you can get it through us, Lizette. Oh, okay, good, because I, I ordered it on Amazon. It said it was the last one they had. So I yes. I was uh, nervous that I wouldn't be able to get it. But yeah, for um, those who want one, you can you can email us and- we'll, Perfect. We can make and um, yeah, one thing I will say about this book is that um, it was written in, 2000, in 2008, correct, Ron? Um, 2009, yeah. 2009, um, yeah. but I read it, I mean, we're in 2021 and I felt like everything that was in there would absolutely be in an interior now. So it's it's a really, it's a really beautiful book. Highly recommend it. Thank you, thank you. And now um, let's jump into the, uh, all of the questions that we have. We put together a series of really great um, questions that a lot of students, you know, you guys can relate to um, or any young interior designers. Um, and we are on an effort to build our community. So um, thank you all for being here and being part of our um, community of emerging professionals. Um, now, Ron, can you start by sharing with us what inspired to become an interior designer? Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've only got an hour, so. <laughs> and we got a long list. Yeah. <laughs> interior design was, was a second career or is a second career for me. Um, my first degree is in finance. And, um, but growing up, I always had this passion for interior design. I was fortunate enough to have a mother who would indulge me in you know, changing my room around. And then that grew into changing the rest of the house around um, a lot. And my dad was a jazz musician, so he traveled quite a bit. And so that was one of the fun things that my mother and I did together. We would rearrange the house. And, and I was always tinkering with design. I would, when I was really young, like five or six, I would build cut out houses out of cardboard boxes. And I would, you know, do long circular driveways with my hot wheels and, and it was always fun for me. And then um, at about hmm, probably seven, eight years old, my dad would take me on rehearsals with him. And uh, he was a part of, um, several trios and he was a studio musician so he worked a lot and I got to visit these really grand homes um, in Beverly Hills, Homeby Hills, the Hollywood Hills because back in the day people when they would have parties they would hire a band they didn't hire a DJ and so my father was lucky enough to be a part of this great trio and um I would tag along and you know, I got to see this really opulent world that most children my age never experienced. Um, there's a lot of adults today that never will experience that. And, um, but I didn't feel like it was going to be a career. It was just something that I enjoyed and I appreciated. And, um, I had a previous business and then I had a bit of a midlife crisis. I wasn't that old, but I had a midlife crisis and decided that I wanted to do something creative. And um, I uh, was introduced to a previous business associate that I was working with that had um, a design firm and he did primarily art and frames and some interiors for uh, the hospitality industry around the world. 
And that got me started. Um, and then because I'm such an overachiever, I decided I wanted to take it even further. And I started getting clients also. Um, and then I went back to school, hence coming to UCLA. And uh, that was a great opportunity for me. It was a lot of work. I'm telling you, you guys, I commend you for sticking with it because <clears throat> I know it's not easy, um, but um, it was really rewarding uh, for the time that I was there. And then I had a really good friend and I still have a good friend that was a producer for a television show called Designers Challenge. And he asked me to do an episode of it. And I, I, I was really nervous about that. I was like, you know, I'm not ready for primetime television. Um, and uh, he, he thought I was really ready. And that turned into, I did six episodes of Designers Challenge. And so with that, and then I started getting all these clients and uh, it just morphed into, I had to decide whether or not I was going to take the clients or I was gonna stay in school or ride that train with, with my clients. And so I decided to um, go with the clients and I didn't finish the program but I'm telling all of you all to stick with it and, and finish the program out because it really is rewarding. And there's so much to learn. Um, and UCLA, I have to say, was a great, great opportunity for me, even the amount of time that I was there. So that's, and then um, cut to, um, Four years later, I had my own firm. And then four years later, I met Jamie. Amazing. Thank you yes. for that story. Um, and I know we discussed this as well, that you were going to, you were encourage everyone to stay, stick with it. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and now that leads to my next question. Are you able to share us a little bit more about your experience while you were at UCLA Extension? Um, you know, because we're all currently there. So we'd love to hear about your experience back when you were, um, you know, a student. Well, you know, it it may be very different because I was there in 1902. Um, <laughs> no, literally it was, uh, it was 20, almost 25 years ago now. Wow. And yes, yes, I have been an interior designer for 25 years uh, plus. There's a couple of more years added to that, I think. Um, and my experience was great. Um, I was still working. So I was a commuter student, which was hard because the program is rigorous. And I would, you know, do my classwork. And, you know, it was like every night and my partner, I would come home and I would say, you know, you're not gonna talk to me for a couple of months because I, I'm going to be inundated. And so I literally would do my homework and then I would have to do work for clients. And it was, it was tough, but I, I, I did the best that I could. Um, but my experience was, was really great. In fact, I still have a couple of friends that were in the program with me at the same time. And we're still friends. And, uh, one of them, Brian, he didn't finish either, but he's gone on to be a producer and, and do great things. And, and another one, Mark, he finished um, and he's doing really well as, as well. So my experience was, was great. And again, if, if I can impart anything today, I would just say to stick it out. And I, I know how hard it is, but stick it out if you can. Thank you for that. And you know what, all I'm going to say is it's exactly the same. We're all in the same routine still now in 2021. So, you know, not much has changed. <laughs> um, now, are you able to tell us a little bit more about Woodson and Rummerfield's House of Design? Are you guys, you know, 
commercial, residential, um, and tell us about how, how you and Jamie became business partners. Well, um, Jamie and I met 20 years ago, um, excuse me, and we, we didn't know one another and we were introduced to one another through mutual vendors we had in contact, in common, I should say, um, and friends and other colleagues who knew us individually. Um, and they would always say, oh my God, you and Jamie are so much alike. And we didn't know one another. And I kept saying, you know, who's Jamie? You know, this was before Google, um, really before, I mean, we, we had internet, but not like we do today. And I finally was, I had had it with hearing about Jamie. And, and um, people would describe her and they said, oh, you know, she's blonde and she's really pretty. And I'm like, well, how are we alike? Because, you know, we couldn't be polar opposites in our appearance. And I, I had a dinner party and I had, I invited her over. She was actually the guest of honor because um, I wanted to meet Jamie and her and her husband came over to our house. Um, and, you know, it's always kind of hard when a designer that you don't know comes to your house and, you know, she's kind of looking around our house and I'm looking at her and, and uh, two weeks later, she, we had a great, a lovely evening. Two weeks later, she had a dinner party and had us over. And surprisingly, her and I had some of the exact same vintage pieces that we thought we were the only purveyors of these pieces, uh, you know, in, in totality. It was like barware and, and furniture also. And my partner looked around, he was like, don't we have that chair? And don't we have those glasses? And she came over to us and she said, oh, so you see why we were looking at your house when we were at your house. And we started talking business right out the gate. And we wanted to do the same things with our career. Um, Jamie and I have a lust for um, antiques and vintage furniture and um, uh, any, anything period with a provenance we love. And so we would never pass those things up. And she said, I have, you know, this, just plethora of furniture and accessories that are in storage. And, and I had the same. And so we opened a showroom. We had a showroom on La Cienega for six years. And um, that was because of all the inventory. We, we can't pass up a great find. And um, so that was, the, that was the start of it. So we, we had the design firm. Our design firm was upstairs. And uh, we had this little atelier downstairs and it was done like a house. And at the time when we were on La Cienega, it was, it was a really sort of turning point for La Cienega. You know, there were Blackman Cruz was on the street, um, uh, Pat McGann, Patrick Dragonette. And it was, there was this great small group of us that, uh, all had these great shops. And we thought, you know, we're gonna get all these, you know, the ladies who do lunch come in and, and buy from us. And it turned out that 85% of our business were other interior designers because we made it really easy for um, designers just to come in and purchase for their clients. And the showroom was done like a house. So it wasn't chock full of things all over. And um, we would have clients come in and buy a whole room. And then we would have to, on a dime, um, restructure that room. And every 90 days, we would change the wallpaper. We would change the paint. Um, we really, it was Jamie and I's incubator to do exactly what we wanted. We were our own client. And so we had a lot of fun with it. And uh, 2008 hit, and that was a rough time for uh, retail. And so we had to decide, you know, do something had to give, and it ended up being the showroom. And but it was it was a great time. And from that, we were we were the founding members of um, LCDQ, 
And little known fact, uh, Jamie and I were amongst the, the founders of LCDQ. Amazing, yeah. so wonderful to hear. Oh, I wish the showroom was still there so that we can all take a peek and, <laughs> and go look you at it. You know, all. it's so funny because people from overseas, we, we still have the same phone number and people will still call us today and say, oh, you know, we're gonna be in the States and we wanna come to your showroom. Um, you know, what are the hours? And, and we just, we kind of laugh and we're like, wow, um, the showroom is, is no longer, but thank you. <laughs> Definitely made an impact then. Yes, it was, it was a good time. Um, well, now that's a perfect lead in into our next question, which um, I know in your book, you talk a lot about your love for the city of Los Angeles and how much um, Los Angeles inspires you. Can you share with us what about Los Angeles inspires you and what, in your opinion, makes it a design inspiration mecca? Well, um, first of all, I'm a native Angelino. Um, I'm a third generation Angelino. And growing up here, um, was was really fascinating um, because we had Hollywood. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I got to visit some of these incredible homes. And Los Angeles is unlike anywhere else. And I've traveled a lot of places and um, Los Angeles is unlike any other place I've ever been to where you can have this world-class architecture right next door to one another. There's not many places in the world that you can have a Wallace Neff next door to a Richard Neutra and down the street from um, an A. Quincy Jones. It, that just does not happen anywhere else. And um, just that history that's, that's so small in this city is, is one that I cherish and love. Um, and I think to a large degree, again, it comes from that grandeur of, of Hollywood and old Hollywood, um, you know, movie sets that were you know, over the top. And years ago, that's how celebrities lived. You, know, you have designers like Billy Haynes who ended up doing celebrities homes that you know he would do like a set and um it's, a, it's different now but that was always always stuck with me and and again because i have this um this firsthand knowledge of of seeing how the world that world lived and and it really is very very special yeah a lot of a lot of people when I always get when people say, oh, LA, I, you know, I, I always say, you're not from here and you don't know LA. <laughs> yes, we do not stand <laughs> for the slander on LA. It's like everyone's been so harsh on LA this past year. And I'm like, you guys, it's still amazing. Fine, go, less traffic for us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that is truly a wonderful perspective. Um, and, you know, all of us students, um, I know Eleanor, she's our wonderful teacher who gets to take us on, you know, to see some of these wonderful houses. So I know that when we all, you know, it's safe to be out and, and about again, we'll definitely be getting out there and looking at all of the architecture that we have here in our own backyard. And I tell you, take every word in that Eleanor puts out because she is a wealth of information and knowledge and and is so passionate about design and architecture and and students as you all well know so you have to cherish uh mrs schrader yes absolutely we cherish you eleanor <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, now, my next question is uh, diving into a little more um, design driven questions. Can you talk to us about your approach to design? And I know you um, and Jamie use the word modage. I hope I said it correctly, but it's the combination of modern and vintage. Um, so can you share what that means to you guys? It's modage. Modage. Okay. Yes. yes. There's a French <laughs> plant to it. And the way that that came about, um, again, when we had the showroom, we would have these big parties. We were known for our parties at the showroom. And um, 
the showroom was was a mix of of modern, uh, new hyper modern pieces, along with um, vintage pieces pieces as well as as antiques, and we couldn't figure out let's what how do we coin this you know and people would always ask us what is this called you know they would come in the showroom and look around they go what what is this what do you, what do you call this and i don't know we were somewhere and i think jamie and i had a couple martinis and we were like modage it's modern and it's vintage and it just kind of stuck and so that came into the book and and we were known for that for a long time, actually. So I, I appreciate that you went through the book and you found that because after the sh after not having the showroom any longer, that term wasn't as relevant as it is now. So yeah, I that's where it comes from. Uh, I'm gonna officially announce that it's 2021 and we are bringing Madaj back. So <laughs> there you go. Find it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, now, can you talk to us about your design process when you start a project? Well, when we start a project, we really, you know, first of all, we're not the type of designers that come in and say, you know, it, it's our way or the highway. Um, we really get into the heads of our clients and how they live. So, um, and we, we do a whole programming sheet. And if it's a couple, um, they both have to do it. And what's in this programming is, um, you know, we ask, you know, what colors do they love? What colors do they not like? Um, do they entertain? Do they have kids? Do they have dogs? Do, you know, we ask a gambit of questions and you'd be surprised um, couples never, I, don't, I can't tell you one time where they were ever in agreement on what they like. So then that gives you the roadmap. You've got to say, okay, I've got to make both of these fractions happy. And I've got to, I've got to really look at this from a broad view. And so I think more than anything else, you have to listen to your clients. That's how we start a project. And then it goes from there, um, you know, depending upon the type of architecture that it is. And we really take into consideration the architecture um, just because somebody has a 1940s house doesn't mean that, you know, the whole house needs to be B&B Italia. Um, it just, I, I just feel like that's sort of a disservice. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Um, and I always, we always try to look for some type of provenance um, to a project. So there's, there's always a mix of new and old. So if a client comes to us, they know that that's what they're gonna get. They're not going to get everything brand new that looks like it just came off the sh a sh from a new showroom floor. So um, I think that's the approach we take with every project. I, th I think if there's, if there's one singular thing that we do. Yeah. Super helpful. That is so great to hear. I think, you know, we, we learned so much about the technical things that um, it's so nice to hear, you know, how you approach an actual project. Um, because in school, we're only approaching, you know, um, uh, concept projects and things like that. We're not dealing with humans yet. <laughs> right, right. And, and you know, keep this in, in mind. You, you, you have to listen to your clients. Even the ones who say, do whatever you want. Eh, still, you, you, you have to really listen to the client and remember things that they say. You know, so, you know, you're, you're going to be pseudo therapist as well. Because you know you gotta get into the head of these clients, and and in some time, in some situations, you've got to be a little bit of a referee, especially with couples. Sometimes we we've had to to do that a, a fair amount. Yeah. 
we are ready for it. <laughs> um, now in your projects, um, and then based off of a lot of the images, you guys use a lot of color textures and patterns. Can you talk to us about the roadmap of how you select colors, textures, and patterns for one project? Well, you know, clients a lot of times will look at that process that we go through and really simple and really easy when in actuality, a lot of thought and effort goes into um, color pattern. And as you all well know, color is a, a science and putting it together has got to work just right. So we're known for being a little bold in our color and our designs. Um, we're, we're not really the brown and beige designers. And, you know, we've, we've had clients that have come to us, one client in particular, celebrity client. Um, I met with her um, and a pop star and she was on a video shoot and I had to, I had to meet with her that day. Jamie had broken her leg so she couldn't go. And so I, went and you know there's this whole team that she has around her and she literally has her head in a shampoo bowl and she says to me she says you can do whatever you want it just can't be brown and it can't be beige and so we said okay and again this is where getting into um the heads of your clients is is really going to um, reward you. Um, and we really push the envelope with, with her. But again, we read the situation with her as well as the house and how she was going to live and use the house. So we went pretty bold. That was probably one of the boldest projects we'd ever done. But at the same time, um, that process of putting the color pattern and it was a big house. So, you know, there was a lot of research, um, a lot of studying that went into the color palette that was going to go all throughout the house. And it, and it is, it's, it's long, it took, it took several months to really hone it in the way that it should have been. Amazing, thank you for sharing that. Um, and now this dives us into our next question of um, how do you hunt for treasures for these wonderful projects? Because I know you love treasures and everyone by treasures, I mean, you know, vintage goods. And <laughs> as you can see, I'm actually, um, we're actually kind of wearing the same thing. And I'm also right? a huge vintage lover. You can see my etagier in the back. Um, so um, yes, can you talk to us about how do you hunt for these wonderful treasures? Well, you know, it, it started, <laughs> Jamie and I sort of coined ourselves high-end dumpster divers um, because for a long time I, I drove a, a big SUV and I literally, you'd be surprised what people put out on, this, on the street, like some really spectacular finds we've, we've found that way. And I, you know, I, I have no shame in pulling over and throwing a chair in the back of, of of the car, um, but we literally shop all over the world. Um, and one of our favorite um, vintage flea markets, and it's the largest flea market in the country, and it's in Massachusetts, it's called Brimfield. And if you ever get a chance to go to Brimfield, Massachusetts, it's, um, it's a week long, and at the time it may have grown now, but it was like seven miles long. And it was this long one road. And then there's all of these um, different vendors that you know, are off this whole long road of just, I can't tell you how many. And Jamie and I would literally do the whole flea market. We, we had to see everything and it would take nearly a week to do that. And we would buy 
truckloads. We would have truckloads sent back to LA. So that was one of our favorite ones. But um, again, around town, you just, you know, JF Chen is a huge one for us. Um, Blackman Cruise. Um, and these are pieces that are one of a kind that you're not gonna find everywhere. Now I'm not taking away from some of the other showrooms, but these are um, some of my really favorites here in town. And, and you'd be surprised about little antique shops in, in the middle of, of nowhere. I mean, Jamie and I have found ourselves in, you know, in we would go to High Point for the um, furniture fair and you know we would rent a car and just drive and we would map out these antique and vintage shops and you'd be surprised what you what you could find so it it's not one place um it's kind of all over is is where we start <laughs> I think uh, we're all adding Massachusetts to our uh, travel list. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I just saw somebody commented on Round Top and in Texas, and we've done Round Top as well. Round Top is, we, we did a truckload from Round Top a couple of times as well. Um, and thank you for that person uh, for bringing that one up. But we always thought Brimfield was, was a, a little better, but Round Top is another another good one. So if you if you can take some time out, both of them are they do them twice a year. They do like a spring and a fall. Um, so and it in those two times and you'd be surprised who you see like we would see because we own the showroom, we would see the owners of Blackman Cruise, we would see the JF Chen people looking and we were all fighting for like, you know, these same pieces. <laughs> And it got to be, you know, sort of a joke over over the years. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and now our, our students actually got the opportunity to go to the flea market in Paris, um, Le Puce. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I think I might have said that wrong, but um, have you had a chance to um, vintage shop in Paris? And were yeah. you, did you ship back an entire crate? I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you a funny, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, this was before, um, really ATMs were as popular. I was in Paris and I was at the flea markets and I mean, I was just loading stuff up. And um, we had credit cards and we had traveler's checks at the time. And these vendors would take a personal check but they didn't take credit cards. And we were like, okay, we're American and we're not we don't have personal checks with us, but why would you take a personal check? So my partner, um, who is now my husband, um, has indulged me for a lot of years. And I had that poor man running all over Paris to every ATM he could find to get as much cash out as he possibly could. And, and because of that, um, some of the banks weren't open and, and um, I didn't get a chance to buy as much as I wanted because, you know, I, I had, you know, a wallet full of credit cards and, but I didn't have, I didn't have checks with me. So um, that was a long time ago. Now it's very different. Um, and shopping in Paris is, is top of the heap, I must say. Um, there and and in um, in uh, Luca, there's one in in Italy. There's one week a month that all the all the um, antique shops in Luca bring all of their wares out onto the street, and so I I I've done some damage there as well. I can only imagine yeah. the damage you did. And I just thought I would share this um, funny story that I was at the flea market and I was buying vintage um, fashion and I ran out of my euros that I had with me at that time. And they did take credit cards, but they were gonna charge me. I mean, it was it was a, a pretty good deal for having the cash. So I started asking all of my mates that were with me, um, collecting euros from all of them to like, 
pay them back when we got back. So right. not much yeah. has changed. Yeah. So at least if everybody goes to the Paris flea market, bring a wad of euros. Um, yeah. You'll get better deals and you know, you'll know you walk out with some treasures. And that's the thing, um, you know, it's the art of the deal. It's almost insulting to uh, vendors like that if you don't haggle with them. Yes, yeah, yeah. You, you never take that first price. Um, now, this leads us into our next question. Um, can you tell us about some of your favorite projects that you've worked on? Um, yes. Um, one, one was the pop star that I mentioned earlier, because uh, it was just so much fun. Um, and it was, she was so willing to push the envelope. Um, which made it really interesting. And that, that project was published, has been published, it was published in AD Italy. It was published here in, um, in style at the time. And I think it was El Decor somewhere else. Um, but that one was, was really interesting because her and her then husband were really fun to work with. And we, we just did some amazing, really creative out of the box things. Um, and um, the, the client was Christina Aguilera. And at the time she, um, she had bought the old estate from the Osbournes. It was where they used to film their show. And so we, turn that house on its ear. And we had actually bought some of, Sharon Osborne collects these incredible crystal chandeliers. And so we bought some of those from Sharon um, for Christina. And, and it just was a really interesting project. And then another one, it was a smaller project, um, but it was, again, the provenance for this project was so incredible because this client just wanted everything the best of the best. And it was a penthouse at the Ritz Carlton downtown. And um, he just gave us total free reign. It was just like one of the best type of clients that you could ask for. And um, if, it, if it didn't have some type of provenance, he didn't, he didn't want it. And um, it was great. Like the bed in the master bedroom was a Charles Hollis Jones um, Lucite bed. And the showroom that we bought it from um, was able to get Charles Hollis Jones to come out and he etched his signature in the bed. He never really does that. And so I got to um, become friends with Charles through that. Um, so it's, it's all those little stories that, that make a project like that really interesting. Amazing. So fast. Those are, those are two. I mean, there's, there's a lot more. I mean, we've had some really good ones. We've, we've been really fortunate, but those two stand out to me. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So fascinating. Um, and now if you guys order his book, uh, you could also see a lot more of his projects. <laughs> um, and now um, we are diving into the wonderful Save Iconic Architecture, also known as SIA. Um, can you, you know, share with everyone what is SIA? Well, SIA uh, stands for Save Iconic Architecture. And it really came about because Luckily enough, Jamie and I have these clients that are, you know, in rarefied air who can afford the best of the best. And we were finding that we were going on consultations and the one, well, there are two that were the straw that broke the camel's back. One was um, the Jim Backus estate in Bel Air, excuse me, and Jim Backus for all of you younger people were, was Mr. Howell on Gilligan's Island. And he had passed away a few months prior and his wife had sold the house. And it wasn't a super large house for Bel Air. It was probably 4,000 square feet. 
and the client, and I mean, it was completely intact. The grounds were incredible. Um, it was just majestic. And Jamie and I went out, the client called us and said, you know, I really want to work with you guys. Can you come out for a consultation? And we got in the foyer and the first thing she said to us was, um, well, we like living here, but the house is too small, so we're gonna tear it down. And it was this beautifully intact Regency. Um, and I don't know who the architect was, but um, Jamie and I, our eyes got like saucers and we said to her, well, if you were going to tear it down, why'd you buy it? I mean, it was like, couldn't you have bought something else that, you know, didn't have this beauty to it? And she went on to try to explain to us um, why they wanted to tear it down. And we knew then that they weren't the client for us and we didn't take the project um, because it just, there was no way that we could have worked with them. And um, so we left there and we were in the car and we were just fuming. It's like, you know, we're gonna drive by here in six months and this house is gonna be gone. And we kept saying, you know, somebody's gotta do something. Somebody's gotta do something. And, um, you know, some time had gone by. And then the next story was really the one that made us form SIA. And that was, um, Richard Neutra's Chewy House. We have a client who wanted a double lot. She wanted to build a compound for her and her family. And, you know, it's not easy finding that type of land in LA where you could really build a couple of compounds. So this realtor that we were working with said, you know, there is a property that's at the very top of Sunset Plaza but it's got this old crappy Neutra on it. And Jamie and I, we were like, wait, wait a minute, old crappy Neutra, that those don't, they don't juxtapose. So she took us up there and um, Jamie and I, we were just like, oh my God, we've got to get somebody to buy this house before it's torn down. And it was maybe one of, Richard Neutra's top 10. Um, it's a small house, it's 1200 square feet, um, but it literally has 360 degree views. It's at the very top of Sunset Plaza Drive. And we made it our mission to try to find someone to buy it. In fact, it got so sort of contentious that the owner had barred us from the house. He wouldn't let us come up there anymore because we started bringing people from the city <laughs> up there and it got to be, and we then called the LA Conservancy to see if they could help us. And, you know, we knew some of them and Linda Dishman just told us, she said, you know, we're too busy, we, we can't do this, but you can landmark it yourself. And so that was the, the start of, we learned that in Los Angeles, you don't have to be the owner of a property to landmark it. And so that set us out on that was our path, was to save the Chewy House. And um, that was about five years ago now. And I'm happy to announce that the house is saved. Um, uh, owners have bought it and they're going to do an adaptive reuse on it. They're going to add on to it, but really in keeping with the original architecture. And you'll, you'll really get the sense that the architecture has stayed the same. Now, I know that in today's world, 1200 square feet for most people just would not work. So um, Tim Campbell is the architect on it now. And we've, we're actually gonna be doing a documentary with him to go through the whole process of remodeling um, the Chewy house. And it's going to be really fantastic. It's gonna be nearly 6,500 square feet after it's done, but really a um, huge mindful addition to it. Um, but that's how 
it got started. And in Los Angeles, I just, it's just so hard that people feel like they can come here and just tear down what little history we have. I mean, there's, there's, there's not a lot. I mean, when you talk about Paris and, and London and Italy, I mean, you wouldn't think about tearing down, you know, a townhouse in London or a, a flat. You just would not do that. And people come here and think that they can just have free reign to just erase our, our history. And again, as I said earlier, we, we have world-class architecture here. And, um, you know, a lot of ego has gotten into the way that, you know, bigger is better and, you know, but at the peril of ripping down our history. So that is how SIA was formed and it's our mission to, what we do is landmark, bring education and awareness to these iconic structures in Los Angeles. And so we're, we're trying to save as many as we can. Thank you for your work in doing that. Um, it is so wonderful and so important, um, especially for all of us students who are you know, transitioning into work. Um, and we get, you know, we might run into some of these clients um, which now leads me into my next question of how can people support Save Iconic Architecture? Well, um, I'll give you the um, web address. And one of the, one of the things is um, volunteers. Um, so some of you students who are interested in preservation, we would love to have you help and volunteer with us. Um, and um, it takes money to run a nonprofit. So donations are always helpful. Um, and literally we have a really small staff. It's Jamie, myself and, and a couple of others. And we have a, a good board that we're really trying to, um, like I said, one step at a time to save some of these. And, and we're working in tandem with the LA Conservancy as well. So, you know, they've been a big help to us as, as well. But um, what I'd like to do is, um, and Eleanor and I have, have spoken about this um, before and Jamie, um, just how we can involve the students in, in helping uh, with, with this cause and helping us. So, um, I'll share more info um, with Eleanor on that and with you, Lizette, and, and maybe we can disseminate this and have you guys help us a little bit more. Yes, absolutely. There, there's, there's, there's research that we need done um, that, you know, Jamie and I just, we just can't do on our own. And I think it would be an interesting project um, for students like you, you, you learn a lot. Um, and what we want to do, I never thought I'd be really political, but it's, um, we're getting into legislation and trying to change legislation in LA. Because for all practical purposes, you can go get a demo permit and the city of Los Angeles has no idea that they're, you're pulling a permit on a Richard Deutscher or a Paul Williams. Um, they don't know. So we're trying to bridge this gap to bring, um, to list all of these, these properties um, across LA so that when one of these projects comes up for a demo permit, it's red flagged and um, change it because the LA, um, the city council, you know, and we, we go to lots of hearings, you know, they're always appalled as well, or at least they act like they are um, when some of these projects are torn down. You know, one of the big ones that's gonna be happening soon is the Lytton Savings Bank building on the corner of uh, Sunset and Crescent Heights. And that's going to be a huge um, Frank Gehry project. And, you know, 
we all you know, admire and um, care about Frank Gehry, but at the same time, this could have been a prime example of adaptive reuse, that that building could have been brought into the design of, of that uh, new complex that's going there. And I went to a public hearing and, and you know, I, I'm not afraid of anybody. <laughs> And so Frank Gehry was sitting like right behind us on the front row and I turned around and I looked him dead in the eye and I said, Mr. Gary, wouldn't you want someone like me in 50 years standing up to save one of your projects? And, you know, he just kind of looked at me, but I wanted it to be known. It's like, it, it, it's, Yes, you're Frank Gehry, but no, it's not cool to just tear down what is, you know, a fabric. I mean, this is 60s architecture, but it's a fabric of, of our city. And, um, you know, when you erase that, you know, you younger people, you're not going to know what this history is. I mean, because it's being erased. Um, and this is, at this time, it's being erased faster than it ever has been before that I've ever seen. So, yes, that's, that's SIA. That's our, our uh, it's a passion project, but it's a lot of work at the same time. So everyone, make sure you guys support it. And I also will mention that... Um, I know you didn't mention this, but everyone should follow the Save Iconic Architecture Instagram um, because uh, you know they they're you guys are always sharing about different projects that you guys are working to save and things like that. So that's another great way of yeah. And the website is there, and um, the website is uh, SIA Projects Plural um, dot org, and you can go on and and find out what we're doing and and what is the latest and the greatest. So, and then the Instagram is also really beneficial and that's uh, Save Iconic Architecture. And um, Gerardo in the chat actually just asked if uh, the AIA is supportive on these uh, preservation matters. Some are um, and some aren't. Um, you'd be surprised. <laughs> uh, you get some architects who are real modernists and, and want to do, do these new future forward projects and don't care so much about the history of, of neighborhoods. Um, that's one of the other things that, you know, we really are trying to to save is like neighborhoods. Like you drive around in West Hollywood now and you know you had these sweet little Spanish bungalows and now you've got these big behemoth boxes that just take over the whole lot to lot. And it just is so, um, so out of context for the neighborhood. And they're just like big eyesores and it's just changing the whole trajectory of, of neighborhoods. And, um, and again, you know, I'm not anti-growth. There's a lot in LA that should be torn down that you know, I would help with a sledgehammer. Um, but then there's others that just uh, need some TLC. They don't need to be torn down. Thank you for that. Um, I hope everyone can remember that as they're working on these projects and getting these requests to tear down these beautiful homes. <laughs> and one of the things I would stress to students is, is learn, the, and whether it be in LA or wherever you end up, but just really try to take in the history of wherever you are. And it'll give you a different perspective on your designs even. Um, it, it LA in particular, like I said, uh, you know, when you, when you look back, you know, it was really 
heavily started by the entertainment industry and um, and it grew from there. So, you know, you have these really sort of fanciful, sweet little bungalows and areas. I used to live in um, an area in Los Feliz in Franklin Hills. And that area was built actually for a lot of the employees who worked for Disney. And, you know, they could, they could walk to the studios. Um, there's all these different staircases around the neighborhoods because you could, you could walk to the studios. And so that history, you know, once it's erased, it's gone forever. It's never gonna be repeated. And again, it's the fabric of our city. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to keep it. And now um, this is the last question we have for you before we dive into the Q&A that um, some students have submitted some questions. Best advice you would give your student self? Uh, oh, my student self. Yes. Um, okay, my best advice to my student self would be to have stayed in school and finished the, project, the, the program. <laughs> That, that would have been mine. My circumstances, as I said, took me in a different direction and I don't regret it, but I would have liked to have stayed. And now one piece of advice for, um, that you would give to students now. Um, get through the program and take in as much as you possibly can with um, internships, being on the, on the job and learning from other designers who are experienced, having that wealth of knowledge is, um, I think is key and is, is so important. It really sort of will guide you in a whole nother way. Um, you'll, you see how a firm works on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and as I mentioned, some of my stories where, again, you have to get into the heads of the clients. You really see how all the inner workings work when you do that, because that part really, you're not gonna learn in school. Um, it, it really is experiential. So Amazing. that would be my advice. Excellent. Well, now we're going to dive into the Q and A and, um, everyone, if you still have a question you would like to submit, you can submit it in the chat. I'll keep an eye out. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with, um, the first one, what advice would you give to a young black designer trying to break into LA's interior design industry that can sometimes feel unwelcoming to people of color? It's interesting that that question has come up. Um, I belong to a design consortium called the Design Leadership Network. And it's, um, it's global now, but um, we have formed a new foundation called the DLF, uh, Design Leadership Foundation. And it is specifically geared toward changing the perception and bringing design or bringing diversity and inclusion into design. And one of the things that I really stress and I'm at a point in my career now where I can do this um, because you know, I've, I've been doing this for a lot of years now. And when I started, there really weren't any other black designers that I could have looked up to. And I always say that um, you have to sometimes see it to know that it can happen for you. And now there's a lot of young black designers who have come behind me um, and some that I've mentored and um, have gone on to do great things. But I, the one advice I would say is to persevere as much as possible 
Um, and to that student, if, if you want to talk about some of these issues and um, have a, a face to it, I, I'm, I'm always open. So um, again, I just, I think to a large degree, seeing it is half the battle, seeing someone who has, has done it that will allow you again to persevere because it, it can happen. And there's, again, there's a lot more. There, there weren't as many when I was coming along. There, I remember there was one black designer, uh, Roderick Shade, and he and I were at a party together um, and we had never met. And he looked across the room at me and I looked at him and we, we both knew of one another. And it was so funny, we, we made our way to one another and he looked at me and he said, you're the other one. And, um, and at that time, really, it, and especially males, um, we were kind of it. He was on the west, on the east coast, and I was I was here on the west coast. So, um, but persevere, persevere. Thank you for that. And I will say that our our student chapter has also been working on more inclusion and and promoting diversity in design because really our student body is totally it's completely diverse. So you know. Right. This is why it's important for all of us to come together as a community of emerging professionals, regardless of, you know, um, color of skin or, or anything. We're all here yeah. together, learning, um, sharing the same passion for design. And and one of the other things that I have been doing is is um, trying to change the hearts and minds of showrooms um, and colleagues, because I'm, I'm just gonna be honest and frank about it, not all of my colleagues in this industry have been so welcoming. And, um, and I will be the first one to, to push now. I may not have been as vocal maybe 10, 15 years ago as I am now. And as now I'm gonna hit you right between the eyes with them. If you don't like it, too bad. <laughs> yeah we all need some more of that, <laughs> Not that. Uh, excellent well thank you for that and thank you to the student that asked that question um now we got this question twice um of how have client been meetings been in a virtual aspect oh um <laughs> it um it, it's gotten a bit easier but um what we what we started doing was really because as we all know a lot of what we do um is very tactile you you've got to touch and feel and you've and it's very personable you've got to be in front of the client we we meet with on in normal times we meet with our clients a lot and so to have that just completely shut off was really difficult but we, what we learned was we would put packets together um, for a project, and it, and you know it ended up being several packets. But that only happened, excuse me, midway through the pandemic because we couldn't even ship things at first, and um, and you know you couldn't get things from a showroom, you couldn't get samples, you couldn't you know go sit on a on a sofa so you know they had to take our word for it about certain furniture pieces that they couldn't see but we one client in particular we have a, a weekly zoom meeting with this client and we go through and literally she will go through the whole house of san francisco projects big house and she goes through with her iPad and we're following her. And, um, you know, she has just now started to let contractors in the house. So, and I wasn't comfortable getting on a plane and, and being in our house either. So um, I have started where I'm pointing to the contractor 
on where things should go and how they should go and sending her these packets of, of information. I mean, like boxes of stone samples and fabric samples and, you know, um, plumbing fixtures. Um, you know, we might buy one and send it to her and, and you know, what do you, what do you think of these? So it's, it's just made it a lot more work and it's not easy, but you know, we, we've had to be nimble and um, it, it's not the easiest process right now, but you know, you, you gotta make a way through it. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with what we've been given. Absolutely. <laughs> we're all like on Zoom University for a year now. So, right, so right. Thank you. <laughs> um, and now this is an interesting one. Um, what time of the day are you most creative? Oh, um, I'm most creative in the earlier part of the day. Uh, Jamie is most creative in the latter part of the day. She's, she's a night owl and I'm like an early riser. And so we typically don't take meetings before 10 a.m. because she's just not having that. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I like to get at it first thing in the morning. I, I do yoga in the morning and um, that, that's another thing that has changed. You know, my yoga classes are now on Zoom, but, um, and from that standpoint, I actually kind of like it better to be in my own house and do it. But yeah, after that, I, I am really, pumped and ready to go. Amazing. Um, and now someone asked, uh, what were the challenges you faced when you first started your design business, uh, including in your early projects? And what advice do you have for designers um, looking to start their own business? Well, I, again, I was really fortunate um, because I had owned my own business prior to design for, um, Eight, eight years, seven years, seven and a half. Yeah, almost eight years. And so I, I knew how to run a business. Um, and, and that's what's not easy for everyone to start out and know how to run a business and to run a design firm. And this is the advice I would, I would give to students work for someone else, work for another design firm for a while, see how it's, how it's done instead of diving right in. Again, I was lucky because I knew how to run a business. And so when I started my own, it was just, it was like starting any other new business. The one harder part was going out and marketing myself and getting new clients. But then that happened for me, as I said, from HDTV, that I, I, had a, I had a real ace in the hole with that. So, but I, I would say to work for someone else and, and try to take in as much knowledge as you possibly can, if you want to be on your own. A lot of people don't wanna be on their own. They, they wanna work for, for someone else and there's nothing wrong with it at all so don't feel like you know you have to be on your own to be successful in in this business excellent and now we have one more um i know we've gone a little bit over time but you promised me we'd have your for the afternoon but it's yeah, been such a great it's been such a great chat it's been so informative um i hope you guys in the audience have felt the same um, how do you determine if your fee should be per hour or percentage or something else? And us as students, we're not too familiar with the fee structures and how, how does the, you know, the, the financial side of it work? Um, right. And I tell you, um, even after all this time, it sometimes depends on just the breadth of, of the client. So we, we do both. We do hourly as well as a flat rate. And I have to say that as time goes on, I really like doing the flat rate. And I know years ago, it 
sometimes it would scare people because um, you know if you took the um, cost per square foot of the house, well, you know when you t when you throw you know a, this is going to be two million dollars in front of a client. Sometimes you know they're scared, even though they have the money. But to hear that number <laughs> right out the gate is can be intimidating. And um, so we do, we do both, but I am, as time goes on, as I said, I prefer to do a fixed fee because then you can break it down and there's no ambiguity because clients will always want to challenge you on intellectual properties. And that's all we have is, is our time. And, you know, you can be as explicit as possible in your time billing and clients will still want to challenge you on it. So if you have that sort of locked in to this fixed fee and, and after a while, you know what it's going to, to take to finish a project um, and unless there's scope creep and then you, you've got to a lot for that as well in your contract that you know if, if it goes beyond this then this is a change order and you've got to go on to another phase so yes excellent well thank you so much everyone for taking the time um and taking a little bit out of your friday afternoon to join us we hope you really enjoyed it and we hope you learned a lot it seems like the chat was very active so it seems like people really did enjoy it um and thank you once again ron as well for your time Thank you for having me and good luck to all you students.